All right, welcome back to the next session, which uh, appears here. Uh, so we've now got uh, two great things. We've got uh, James Hall introduced in a minute, and then we're going to do the workshop feedback. Uh, first, can I uh, say a word from our sponsor, uh, which is uh, Mosaic. Now, I have a vested interest here because that's my proper job. So actually, I, I, I have a real job. This isn't my job. Um, so you've got on, in front of you an amusing leaflet, which is case studies, which you might enjoy reading about the sort of recruitment that we do at Mosaic. Um, if anyone can spot the typographical error in here, uh, come and tell me later and win a prize. Uh, so there is one that I know of, but you never know. There might be, there might be more. So that will be fun. Um, right, I'm going to introduce James. I'm not going to, again, you, you've got his biography in the, uh, in the program. Um, James is a sort of, I don't know, a sort of quantitative Doctor Who, I suppose. Um, uh, but is, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to invite him back. He was one of our top rated speakers a couple of years ago. And he does really interesting uh, analysis, really, of, the, of a kind of the sociology of science through statistical analysis, I'm going to paraphrase. Um, he's also the most annoying speaker in the world, you'll be pleased to know. Um, I just thought I'd add this to your intro. Uh, James, basically, I wrote to him in about, oh, I don't know, August, and, and said, would you like to speak? And he wrote back in November and said, yeah, sure, absolutely, I'll see you then. And I, I haven't heard anything from him since until he walked into the building seven minutes ago. Um, so he's not unreliable, he's very reliable but a little unnerving to have on your program. But I absolutely commend him to you. I think he's going to do a great presentation. So let me please ask you to welcome James. Thanks, Mark. Do you need a hug uh, there? I'm, I'm <laughs> for, forgive my. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. Thanks, uh, Mark, for inviting me. Uh, I'm delighted to, to talk uh, with publishers and those kind of uh, close to the publishing business because that's really the core of what I do to understand and analyze the scientific system. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, some findings that we've kind of uncovered through these large tranches of publication, which allow us to understand and really speak to major policy issues. One issue is replicability crisis that people have been thinking about for uh, quite some time and is in some ways, you know, kind of reaching a peak in some fields in psychology and genetics and some areas of medicine. And so uh, I'm going to talk about centralized communities and non-replicable results. Uh, and just a little bit about myself. So I run a, a computational social science program at the University of Chicago. And um, also a center called Knowledge Lab, where we try to basically take large-scale publication data, but also other kinds of information uh, and opinions and preferences from individuals, intelligent crowdsourcing, like Mark was doing on his typo identification, uh, represent uh, this, uh, and then use it to understand the collective system of knowledge uh, in some more powerful way, understanding biases and heuristics by which the scientific system and technological system work, and then to use those to transform that system. Uh, so for example, to, you know, I, I, I'm dubious that if we can't do better by taking into account these biases that we don't know very much uh, at all. Um, and so we're really interested in measuring uh, knowledge and its extent and its distribution and its sharedness across individuals, across communities. So um, the data that I use um, are many things, but, but often publication data, patent data, grant proposals, preprints, uh, conference proceedings, et cetera, to give this rich trace of what it is that scientists and scholars are doing across the process. And we're trying to build a kind of science of science uh, and innovation to speak to major policy issues about how to fund science, how to um, incubate the kinds of ideas that, uh, that you want. And so we've had a couple of pieces that uh, came out uh, in Science and Nature uh, over the last year, uh, one that kind of reviews this field, the science of science, um, and uh, another which kind of considers the idea of science uh, increasingly being under scrutiny for the purpose of, of really enhancing its potential. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I advocate is reading uh, and using computers to read not only the text, but also the complex social and technical production process of ideas and findings behind the text, beneath the text, and using those to 
to improve and increase our understanding of what's actually going on. So um, one thing, one feature of the scientific system uh, recently has been the prevalence of concerns about reproducibility in drug discovery, in psychology, uh, in a number of areas of, of medicine and cell biology, et cetera. Uh, and so this is a paper with uh, colleagues Valentin Danchev and Andrei Ruzhetsky. So we're interested in basically taking papers um, many, many papers and the claims inside those papers and kind of doing a high throughput replication reproducibility study uh, for science. So um, I would say the, the, the criticality of the issue for science is that increasingly science is becoming a, a collaborative big uh, science and big team system uh, where there are networked centers and labs uh, which as collectives end up producing findings. Uh, and it turns out that this is uh, very efficient for individual scientists' promotion prospects and getting attention in science. Um, it turns out that it may be less efficient for driving and accelerating science forward. So this has led to an expanding scientific output and the importance of distributed knowledge production, of, of researchers increasingly relying on others' results to accomplish their own new discoveries. So in 2016 alone, we've got more than 1.2 million uh, articles and in the last 10 years, almost 10 million articles. And so this raises uh, the importance of thinking about this reproducibility concern that, that many findings, so between 75 and 89% of peer-reviewed studies, many argue cannot be reproduced in the areas in which they've investigated these. So what does that mean? Well, uh, it could be that uh, people are sharing ways of analyses, and, and as a result, there, there are fewer independent experiments. There could also be distributed contamination of various types. So this is the HeLa cell debacle, where you've got 30, almost 35,000 articles based on misidentified cells, which are cited by an estimated half million papers. So people thought that they were findings about uh, kidney cells, they thought they were findings about gut cells. Uh, they were, in fact, these HeLa cells, right? And so basically the identification of the scientific findings is completely um, wrong. And um, scientists, of course, share and obtain contaminated cells by their personal social networks using contaminated machines, etc. cetera. Um, so the question that we were asking is, what's the, the impact of this collaborative network structure on findings, right? So basically, what are the structures that increase or decrease this, this reproducibility? And so uh, we wanted to look at this in the context of a specific case. Here we looked at it in terms of drug gene interactions. So these are drugs that are used to, to up or down regulate a, a disease-related gene. And so we took basically 70,000 of these claims from the literature. So we tranched through the rich literature and we identified cases where there are drug gene interactions and we, we uh, worked with the scientific community. They have databases where they also extract those and we linked those to the literature to identify the overlapping teams and communities that produce claims on any particular association between drugs and genes. Uh, and then we link those up through uh, uh, identification with a massive high throughput experiment called the Lynx experiment. It, it performs about 2 million experiments, about 200 on any particular drug gene association across different uh, titrations or levels of the drug, different cell lines, etc. And we did this to identify the degree to which characteristics of the teams which were identified through publication increased or decreased the likelihood that those findings would reproduce in the future. Right? And um, and so uh, we find very different things when we look at the published claims versus the experimental claims. So the published claims, once someone publishes a claim, almost everybody agrees with the claim. Um, once you find an effect in the scientific databases, it's about a 50-50 likelihood that that will reproduce uh, in the scientific system over time. Um, these range from very sparse communities with individual labs working uh, in independence versus like large network teams, which are increasingly common uh, in science and technology. And so when we actually survey this space and we kind of like place a value on any particular claim as a function of the number of people that have made it, as a function of the number of independent teams that have contributed to it, we get a score. And um, it turns out that these scores are highly predictive of the likelihood that, uh, that these claims will replicate. So, so science is not completely broken. Uh, when more people make the claim, it's more likely that those claims replicate. But 
uh, and the same is, is true here. So you see, you know, where we've got contradictory claims, it's a very low likelihood of replicating, right? It's a negative likelihood. Where you've got very strong support and agreement with independent groups, it's a very high likelihood. So it's the difference between any random claim is like 10% greater than random to replicate, uh, and, a, uh, and one that's really highly supported by many different independent research groups is about 60% more likely. So it's a dramatic difference. In fact, it's the most dramatic difference we can find of any feature that influences the likelihood to replicate in the future. So what we were interested then in looking at is what well, one trend is that there's increasingly networked overlapping uh, teams in the context of scientific discovery. And those increasingly overlapping teams are using increasingly the same methods drawing on the same research, uh, et cetera. And they kind of violate this principle that uh, Jean Perrin uh, advocated in determining Avogadro's number in chemistry with many, many different kinds of techniques and approaches. And so we identified across all of the communities, each community was associated with a particular uh, drug gene association, and we looked at the overlap of the researchers that were producing those claims, the overlap of the methods by which those claims were produced, and the overlap of the degree to which their priors or their background experience, which was encoded in the citations, um, overlapped or were distinct. Uh, and uh, we looked at this across, uh, again, 52,000 distinct claims, some of which had uh, over 100 um, claims published in the literature for and against. And you can already see that basically the top layer are those who agree or disagree with a particular claim, uh, and the, uh, the second panel is the degree to which the authors overlap. And as you can see, it's, it's very likely that if the authors overlap or if the methods overlap or if the background knowledge overlaps, that they will agree with the finding that went before them. Uh, we also looked at the centralization of scientific communities, which means if you get a single, for example, center PI that's on many, many papers over time, they have enormous influence over the scientific system, um, some claims, even if there are many such claims, are highly centralized. The papers all come out or are connected with these centralized star scientists. Uh, and so the intuition is that densely connected communities involve these repeat collaborations, exposure to similar methods, prior knowledge, and reduce the, the space of explored conditions, reduce the likelihood that those findings will replicate. So basically, the findings will replicate each other. They'll be highly reliable, but not at the bullseye, right? They'll be highly reliable somewhere else because they're not 50 independent experiments they're like 1.2 independent experiments, right, that are performed over and over again by these overlapping groups uh, and methods. And, um, and this is, and so we see systematically that social independence induces, or dependence induces this uh, agreement, and that findings from centralized communities, um, decentralized communities, independent communities, are much, much more likely to replicate. So that entire effect of kind of science working, which is to say like more claims in the literature being associated with more robustness disappears as a function of dependence or connection across these scientific labs. If there, in some cases, there are 50 or 60 claims made by these overlapping teams which are indistinguishable in their robustness from a single PI in a single laboratory, right, uh, performing their art and publishing it in the scientific literature, which leads to this enormous distortion of understanding which can in some ways be updated and understood as a function of the publication data alone. Um, so decentralized claims end up being much, much more likely to, to replicate. Independent groups producing these claims are much, much more likely to replicate. So these connected communities produce weakened results. Uh, independent and decentralized communities pr produce uh, robust findings, but why don't we pursue them? Well, because they're coordination problems. Right, for those independent, small, non-overlapping groups to get funding, uh, to communicate and organize with each other, and their increased failure rates right, for individual claims. Right? So the idea is, in some sense, every independent experiment is more risky, but the accumulation of those experiments is much, much more robust, uh, which leads to a, a whole host of, of powerful policy solutions and thinking about, on the one hand, a kind of competition policy for funders, science funders and others, to think about the importance of kind of breaking up uh, these big scientific monopolies that produce highly replicable, highly efficient, but, uh, but very unlikely to kind of to reproduce outside their given context. 
and a pluralism policy, where basically you identify different kinds of approaches and you value the importance of those different approaches in identifying uh, signs. It turns out, in other work we've done, that basically overlapping communities not only influence the robustness of science, but they also influence the speed with which things are found. So basically, large overlapping teams uh, end up influencing and increasing the degree to which people um, agglomerate on the same classes of drugs and genes and other classes of elements in the system, right? Because they know that if they're close to other people in the system, they're going to increase the likelihood of citation, appreciation, promotion, et cetera. Uh, but it turns out that that deviates vastly from, so for example, we identified a simple model, the likelihood that any two things would be combined in the scientific system. We identified that from the research literature, and then we found the most efficient model. We found that basically you could do much better, almost between five and 10 times faster at identifying not new things, but exactly what was discovered, right? If you spread more thinly across the scientific space, which involves more risk for individuals, but a much greater return for society um, as a whole. Um, also, uh, I'm just gonna mention uh, the results of one related study in which um, less overlaps and more independence across these scientific systems um, it is accomplished typically by smaller teams. Uh, and so these smaller teams are more robust as a population, but, but more risky as individual enterprises, which is why they're effectively disappearing from the scientific space. Um, my research team uh, had uh, a paper that was on the cover, it's on the cover of Nature this week, that's about this dynamic, where we use large-scale publication data to identify the degree to which large teams develop science incrementally, and small teams disrupt the frontier of science and technology. So, uh, so basically, less overlapping uh, teams influence both the robustness of findings and the speed with which the things are discovered which are discovered, and the degree to which new things are essentially promoted at the frontier of science. And so I'll just walk you through a few of these findings. One of the things that's perhaps the most obvious by a cursory look of large-scale literature databases is just the rise of, of teams everywhere, right? So in science and engineering, in social sciences and humanities, in arts, uh, in patents, um, everywhere, even in humanity, it looks like a flat line, but that, that line at the bottom, which is the humanities line, that's growing too. And, um, and so there's this, the large teams are flourishing, small teams are shrinking systematically across this space. Um, and I would say there is a teams literature and this is the critical assessment, I would say, of that literature, you know, uh, go teams, you know, bigger is better, uh, that large teams that reach across the scientific and technological system provide complex solutions to 21st century problems. Um, and we know that, uh, that they do solve enormous problems. So for example, this is uh, the LIGO experiment that was associated with the 2017 Nobel Prize that detected gravitational waves, which were predicted in 1915, so 101 years before the publication of this paper. It, it was the biggest funded science project uh, from the National Science Foundation in history. It was $1.1 billion. It had more than 1,000 authors on the titular paper that was associated with the prize. It was also perhaps the most conservative experiment in history. Uh, so it was testing 100 and one-year-old hypothesis uh, by a one-author team, Albert Einstein, uh, and, it, um, and it basically tied all of the results that it found to the theoretical general relativity estimates, which is to say that it could not produce surprise by definition. Any surprising result was attributed to a miscalibration of the machine. Right, so uh, it, that's not to say that there was no risk involved. It's possible they could have detected nothing. Uh, but they couldn't have detected anything uh, surprising by definition. And that was partly to protect their investment. The political exposure associated with a funding that great meant that they couldn't be wrong or seen as frivolous or accidental. So we looked at the degree to which small teams, uh, non-overlapping teams versus large-scale teams ended up corresponding or correlating with this risk continuum from kind of exploration to exploitation, from subversion to succession, which has been talked about by historians of science and technology, economists of science, et cetera. Uh, and so we used large-scale uh, publication data, also patent data. We also used software data to see the degree to which this was true across these systems. And what was critical here was not just the metadata, 
on how many people were in a particular team, but also the connection between the present and the past. So we used a measure which had very recently been developed to identify disruption. Uh, so rather than the number of citations that something receives, it's the degree to which a thing that's cited or referenced or appreciated or forked in the case of software ends up eclipsing the things on which it builds, right? So if something cites that work and all of the incremental work on which it builds, um, then that's part of a story of incremental progression. Whereas if somebody cites that work and forgets everything that was before systematically, uh, then it represents a new direction in science and technology. And that might be because it's a whole new field that's not familiar with the history, right? So there are many ways in which something can be disruptive, and we validated this. We, we needed a measure that was simple enough that we could calculate it across um, all of scientific and cultural production, effectively. And, um, and what we found is that um, it, it really uh, identified things which were associated with large-scale prizes, the Nobel Prizes, but also every major international award in biology, medicine, uh, chemistry, physics, et cetera. Um, it distinguished review articles from the things that they reviewed. It distinguished uh, those articles which headlined prior work. Uh, important articles like the Bose-Einstein condensation paper, which won the 2007 Nobel Prize. This is a great paper, but Anytime someone cites that work, they cite it with Bose and Einstein's 1920s papers. Anytime people cite the Higgs boson identification paper, they cite it with Higgs paper from the 1960s. It's seen as a solution to a problem rather than the development of a new problem uh, itself. And so we're using this new dimension to look at all of these, these uh, scientific and scholarly projects over time. Here we render them as trees. Right, so on the left, you've got two papers, that Bose-Einstein Nobel Prize winning paper where all of the branches that cite that core work lean down and cite its references, uh, and this Bach et al. paper which develops essentially a complex systems approach uh, to thinking about the world. Uh, nobody cites its, an its antecedents. It's really seen as starting a, a new field in this space. And um, what we find when we look across science and scholarship as we find with basically every incremental member of a scientific, technical, or scholarly team, there's an exponential decline in the likelihood that their produce will disrupt the scientific system rather than amplify the prior work. Um, and we see this, uh, you know, in many uh, cases. Now, uh, what's a small team? You know, is it two, three, is it seven, is it 10? It kind of depends on the field. It turns out it doesn't matter. I mean, you can cut that sucker anywhere, you know, between one and two, between 25 and 26, and we, fee we see a significant and substantial difference. It's an exponential decline, so it's bigger between one and two than between 19 and 20, but it holds um, everywhere we could find. It holds across all times, places, fields, impact levels. It's greater with greater impact. So award-winning papers that are small teams are much more likely to be disruptive award-winning, Nobel Prize-winning big team papers are much more likely to be developmental or amplifying of, of prior work. Um, Two-thirds of the effect is within person and controlling for the subjects or topics that people are studying. So, so you know, the same person who's working on, you know, uh, a topic, who's writing a review paper, there's no data involved, they, they add a single additional person to the team and it, and it typically, again, decreases the likelihood that that piece disrupts that frontier uh, uh, in ways that, again, are predicted from the entire sample. Um, it turns out we, we were interested in the degree to which this reception of science as being disruptive or developmental ended up being associated with different search approaches, right? So we're trying to diagnose how it is that large and small teams, uh, overlapping and disconnected teams, search through the space of prior ideas. And what we find is that small teams are systematically much more likely to reach further into the past. They're much more likely to reach into less popular prior pieces. Large teams are much more likely to kind of build on yesterday's hits. So it's, it's like a big movie production company deciding, you know, do we, do we produce this, this compelling independent script, you know, Slumdog Millionaire, or do we produce Transformers 8, you know? Uh, and you, we all know what they're gonna produce, right? It's because the receipts are gonna be Transformers 7 minus Epsilon. Uh, maybe plus epsilon, I mean, you know, uh, um, but, and it turns out this is associated with, with impact, so uh, the degree to which you are building off yesterday's hits, you have yesterday's audiences, right, and so all of the attention that comes or is lavished on large team uh, 
papers, like, for example, the Human Genome Paper, which was, it was optimized in its publication in 2000 uh, to, to maximize its publicity. I mean, they hadn't actually finished sequencing the genome, uh, you know, it was, but it was published at that moment to really maximize attention to the discovery, and that's what happens. All of the citations kind of happen immediately. Small teams are much more likely, if they're cited, to be cited in the relatively distant future, to be much more disruptive in that future, because there's no existing or present uh, uh, market for those discoveries. Why is this the case? Well, partly because small teams have more to gain and less to lose from failure. Large teams obviously have more to lose and less to gain. They've got money on the line. It takes more to fund these large-scale teams. Um, research that we've done also, when we pull out, so papers, many papers have the contributions of authors. We extracted those from hundreds of thousands of papers and identified what we call the brain-muscle ratio. So the, uh, the brain is, you know, people who write and design the research and are involved in many aspects of the research versus someone who performs a southwestern blot or performs a particular statistical analysis, et cetera. And we find that small teams are basically like maces. You know, they're flat uh, with equal contributions. They take more time to develop. Uh, large teams are like pyramids. Right? So it's much more likely for there to be a very small top and a very wide base of contributions. There are fewer brains at work sometimes on those large-scale papers, even though there are many more muscles that are igniting. Um, uh, it's also true that large teams just are dragging in a much wider distribution of persons with a wider distribution of interests, which kind of tend to cancel each other out, a phenomena sometimes known as Linus's Law. Um, and all this is to say that basically if science and technology is smooth, you know, if it's a smooth space, right? Basically, where someone has found advance in the past, we can jump to that place, we can hyperlink to that place and take the next step, and it's gonna be a smooth landscape. That's gonna be the most, uh, you, know, uh, you know, powerful and efficient way to get to the summit of like the greatest, you know, scientific insights and technological insights possible, then large teams overlap in communities which are effectively uh, doing this hill climbing activity uh, would be the most efficient uh, approach. On the other hand, uh, if the scientific and technological landscape is a rugged landscape, right, where there are what we call local optima, you can kind of climb up a hill and then you get stuck, there are diminishing marginal returns to a particular approach, uh, then it's much more valuable to have many more independent groups climbing at the same time different uh, places of, of this landscape so that you can find Mount Everest. Um, and just a, a hunch to give you a sense of how rugged this landscape is, we engaged in a project where we tried to predict from papers and patents all of next year's papers. And again, we had a pretty impoverished view of what a paper is. It's a typed set of elements. You know, there'll be 17 papers that have, you know, these 10 keywords in them, uh, et cetera. But we can predict about 96% of those uh, for next year. And the thing that's striking is um, what predicts the importance of things next year by far the most, better than anything else, is unpredictability under this most predictive model, right? So the model that's best predicting what's going to happen next year, the things that show up which are most unlikely under that scenario are the things, we can predict 50% of the likelihood of being in the top 1% of citations. So, which is to say that it's completely unexpected by the participants who are, are, are playing there. So the difference between large teams and uh, you know, overlapping networks and small teams and disconnected networks is the difference between short and long bets. Right, so the small teams, the highly disruptive discoveries end up uh, vesting uh, much further into the future. Uh, at about 20 years, they dramatically overpass uh, the likelihood of, of developmental work uh, that comes from large and overlapping teams, typically. Um, so you have to have a long view to take this approach. Uh, but it's all the more concerning because they're vanishing small teams in the landscape and vanishing independence with the increasingly uh, networked way in which uh, science is promoted and funded. And you can't just fund small teams and fund disconnected teams alone because the key is that that's, they're correlated with risk. And so if you look at, at small teams that are funded intensively because the funding process is so conservative, those teams look indistinguishable from large teams in terms of the likelihood to disrupt the frontier. You actually need to have a taste for risk uh, to fund the kind of science that's going to supplant uh, 
current ideas and, and basically change the, the, the peak uh, that you're working towards. Um, so uh, I think all of this suggests that just from this publication data alone, we can basically develop some really fundamental and powerful insights into the degree to which we're fueling or starving growth in scientific discoveries and technological invention, uh, and the importance of promoting small and decentralized teams relative to the trend uh, to increase collective imagination, uh, collective certainty, uh, and collective insights. Uh, and then finally, just the idea of the power of publication data to influence science policy and to, to make insights that are really invisible to scientists and scholars who are sitting within, you know, like ants within this kind of large-scale system, but can't see the larger forces and structures which are at work influencing even them uh, and their work. Uh, so with that, I will uh, close and take any questions. Do we have any time for questions? One question. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Our one question. Yes. Uh, I love the analogy of the adaptive landscape. Mm -hmm. I, I think publishing. I, th I think publishing is on your adaptive landscape, but mm -hmm. everyone's on the big hill, uh, or they think they're on the big hill, mm -hmm. and we need to cross the valley and get across to that even bigger hill. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, it's uh, completely networked. Uh, large, in, uh, um, collaborative, all the things that you were talking about is, that are the problems with the centralized mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, scientific teams. Scientific also teams. With publishers. But, but this is publishers. Uh -huh. So, how do publishers cross? Uh, if, if, it, if, if the publishing landscape is rugged, how do publishers change the way they work in order? to find those smaller, higher peaks mm -hmm. in, the, in the scholarly communication landscape? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great question. And, uh, and I think you know, time will tell, but I would say in a number of other business contexts, it's absolutely clear. So uh, just a, a, an anecdote. So a friend of mine, Duncan Watts, was working at Microsoft Research for many years. The head of Microsoft Research told him right after WhatsApp came on the market and kind of took over the Indian instant messaging landscape and said, you know, what I need you to do is develop the next WhatsApp. And his response is, that is the stupidest thing I've ever been asked. Because there were like hundreds of WhatsApps, you know, kind of like that were available at the time. Which one was going to become the one that would kind of take over was anybody's guess. And so I think the, the question for large-scale organizations, right, large-scale publishers is, does it make sense um, to incubate uh, things internal and pay for failure? Or does it make sense to kind of essentially... Uh, venture out and consider purchasing, right? And so in the same way that kind of venture capital is expecting kind of like a one in 20 or one in 90, you know, one of, you know, one of 20 success rate, I think if we're actually really interested in identifying these higher peaks, we have to have a very different tolerance for failure um, and essentially kind of buying up high-risk approaches uh, offloads the cost of some of that failure. And so that's systematically what we see successful large-scale companies doing. Like, it's impossible for Microsoft to anticipate the next WhatsApp. Um, do they want to survive in the next landscape? Well, then they need to keep a very cogent view and make bets with respect to uh, the individual small team bets which are being made by others. In some cases, um, they're, they're creating, you know, Barclays and a number of, of, of others in the banking sector, in the investment sector, are, again, not growing these things internally, but having venture funds by which they're spinning things out and then allowing, you know, not a thousand flowers, but a hundred flowers to bloom, and then allowing essentially those high-risk startups that are incubated outside the firm so that they're not killed by the internal conformity and culture uh, to guide the business. So I think that's one way of thinking about this, but it, it definitely takes um, a, a higher tolerance for risk. So anyway, thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone. Thank you.